Good evening. I hope you're all here for our Brookings Scholar Lecture because we're about to lock the doors. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West and I want to welcome you all here on behalf of Rob Lang, the director of Brookings Mountain West. I was going to welcome you on behalf of President Neil Smotrisk, but I see he walked in. He can, he can welcome you himself. <laughs> Come on down, say. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I won't take very long. Uh, Ron's here, and he's got a whole bunch of really great things to say. Uh, I'm sure that uh, when we're done, Ron, uh, that we'll all be confused on a higher plane. Uh, <laughs> I want to welcome you. Uh, as you know, the Brookings partnership that we have is beginning to really bear fruits. Uh, the interactions are getting deeper and richer. We're having people back for a second time. Uh, and we anticipate that our students and our faculty will be engaged in research that can pr be productive and help this region and make a difference. So for all of you in the audience, I hope you're inspired and uh, that you are uh, but you get a taste of the benefits of our affiliation here at UNLV in a very critical region uh, with a great think tank and Brookings institution. And I know you're going to have a lot of fun today. With that, I will sit down very quickly and let the main course be served. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Just a couple housekeeping matters. We'll get uh, onto our speaker. Uh, this is our first lecture of the year, and we have a, a, what I think is a very exciting program for the fall and spring. There are some printed schedules uh, out on the table in the foyer. Uh, please check our website for uh, additional information and any updates. Our next lecture will be on the 19th. Jim Johnson will be speaking. Jim's been a national leader in politics and business for over three decades. And he will have some very interesting insights. At that point, we'll be about two weeks to the election. So I think we'll have some fearless predictions as well. Uh, so I hope you can join us for that. Other topics we'll be getting in this semester include uh, housing policy and the foreclosure situation. We'll be bringing a Brookings scholar in who's an expert on foreign policy. We'll be talking to us about Afghanistan. So we're, we're able to take advantage of the wide range of Brookings programs. We're going to hear from Ron Haskins tonight. Ron's a senior fellow at Brookings in their economic studies program. He's also co-director of the Center on Children and Families. Ron spoke here about five months ago, uh, a lecture entitled An Opportunity Society. And today he's talking on deficits and disaster. So we are nothing if not a full service operation here at Brookings Mountain West. Ron, would you? Here's that. Thank you very much. Uh, normally when I give a talk, my goal is to ingratiate myself with the audience and have the audience find my remarks attractive and so forth. But today, it's quite different. My main goal today, frankly, is to scare the hell out of you. Uh, because I think we're in the most desperate financial situation the country's ever been in. Uh, if you look at the numbers, we, the deficits were worse after World War II, but there was pretty good reason for that. We just fought a war, and we took very strong action immediately, uh, and within six or seven years, the war deficit, which was huge, was uh, pretty much taken care of. Uh, we have not done that this time. And an underlying theme of what I'm going to say today and an underlying theme of many of the public problems we have in our country is it's the fault of the American people. Now, it's true that we have lousy poly policymakers. They have completely ignored this problem or virtually ignored it. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats are equally guilty in my estimation. Uh, and, and they have yet to catch on. This year, we passed a health care bill that was supposed to be revenue neutral, but the facts are that it is not. It will impose huge costs on the American economy and on the American government in the years ahead. And under the Republican presidency of George Bush, we passed a Medicare Part D benefit that will also impose huge costs on, uh, on the federal government and has greatly increased the deficit. 
And as if that's not enough, we also passed, as you all know, huge tax cuts. So in the old days, Republicans used to say the Democrats are no good because their philosophy is tax and tax, spend and spend, elect and elect. Uh, and Republicans corrected that by doing them one better. The Republicans uh, spent and spent, but they cut taxes and cut taxes to go with it. So you got a double whammy of deficits under Republican administrations. And as I say, the Obama administration or anything has made it worse. But the problem goes back even further than that. So why do I say that the problem is the problem of the American public? And the answer is that we elected those folks. And we continue not to do anything serious about it. I'm going to show you some very recent numbers from this year and from last year that show that the American public is beginning to catch on a little bit, uh, but they don't have the full picture yet. Uh, and they're not insisting on action by any means. Maybe there's some evidence. Maybe some people say the Tea Party uh, really wants to do something about the deficit and will elect only, they'll vote for only officials that will do something about deficit. I don't know if that's actually true. Uh, we'll find out uh, in the fall. And then we'll find out what Republicans do. But so far, even if Republicans were to take over the House and the House and the Senate, which seems very unlikely, but if they were, there is not a hint so far of any plan except for Representative Ryan in the House of Representatives, who has not been joined by his Republican colleagues, to put it mildly, uh, to lay out an actual plan for how Republicans would do a better job controlling the deficit uh, than the president is doing. So I say a pox on both their houses. And in trying to scare the, scare the hell out of you today, what I would like to do is begin by, let's see if I can make this thing work. Look at that, but I'm, a, I'm getting to be an E guy. I still don't carry a cell phone. My kids harass me to death, but uh, I knew, still know how to turn on a TV and I can use a remote control, so I'm gonna, we're gonna be all set today. So here's what I'm going to talk about. The big picture, I want to convince you first that the problem is as serious as I say it is. Then I want to talk about the American public and how the American public has basically failed to address this issue and elect people that will address the issue. Uh, but I want to present a ray of hope through uh, public dialogue and organizations that have not just surveyed. If you just go out and ask people, uh, their views of things, then you come away very frightened and you think, oh, the American public's not going to do anything serious. But if you first educate the public and tell a cross-section of the public what the problem is and what's causing it and what needs to be done and how serious it is, then you will find that the American public quickly changes their mind and then they're willing to do things that otherwise they're not willing to do. Then I want to convince you why deficits are so important. And finally, I want to talk about the elements of a plan for action. I'm not going to lay anything out like I'm here are the most important four things that need to be done, but I'm going to give you some ideas about that. So uh, let's begin with the projections. Now, we have an unusual situation in that the Congressional Budget Office is really handicapped. CBO, by the way, and I think I'll say this several times today, is a spectacular organization. You can completely trust CBO unless they are handicapped by their own rules that under which they have to operate. They're in a very difficult environment. Um, uh, and so you, you can count on what they say, but sometimes, as I say, they're handicapped by the rules. So here you see their projection. This is a CBO baseline, which is pretty bad. It says we're going to have def deficits that average about a, a half a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Half a trillion. Trillion. Amazing. But that's wrong. And it's wrong because of the rules that CBO has to follow. For example, they have to assume that the Bush tax cuts will all end when they're scheduled to end this year. That seems extremely unlikely. Even the president would not end all of the Bush tax cuts. And recently, the former director of CBO in the New York Times said that they should all be extended for at least two years. So if you make a, more, a set of more realistic assumptions, this is what the budget deficit would really look like. So we are going to have huge deficits, and my colleague Bill Gale, uh, who is not handicapped by any rules or anything else, estimates that the deficit actually is going to average over a trillion dollars, close to $1.1 trillion over the next 10 years. Uh, and I'll show you some numbers in a few minutes to show you how the, these uh, deficits will build up. Okay. So now here's part of the story, spending and debt. Uh, spending is part of the problem. Republicans would have you believe spending is the problem, but I think that's not true. 
uh, spending and taxes are both part of the problem. So, but let's start with spending. So here we have Social Security and then a bunch of, medic, uh, a bunch of medical uh, costs that are imposed on government, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, this is the state uh, ch uh, health insurance, child health insurance program, and then the exchange subsidies, these are the new subsidies that the federal government is going to invest in the exchanges that are part of the Obama health reform, and then all other non-interest and then net interest. And in each case, the bar graphs are uh, uh, 2010, 2020, and 2050. So as you can see that as a percent of GDP, even though our assumptions about our GDP will grow in a healthy fashion, Social Security is part of the problem, but it's a modest part of the problem, especially compared to the other parts. Here are health insurance. It's more, it's going to well over double over the next 40 years uh, uh, as a percent of GDP. So tremendous spending on health. Uh, I cannot emphasize this enough. We do not even have a corner of a handle on this. Uh, health insurance has increased now for 20 or 30 years at roughly twice the rate of inflation. Americans are not getting healthier. Uh, we do not get the bang for the buck that other nations get. Other nations do not spend nearly as much money on health care as we do, and yet we don't get the same results that they do. We have great specialty services. We spend a ton of money in the last, say, six months of life, uh, and maybe that has to change. Of course, if you raise that in a political world, then they'll accuse you of favoring death, uh, so it's a little bit tough to talk about these things publicly, but we spend a tremendous percentage of our health care dollars in the last uh, in the last six months and in fact even in the last six weeks of life. Um, I'm going to skip all other non-interest. Here's net interest. Here is really, this drives me nuts and it should drive you nuts too and I'll show you some more data in a few minutes that will drive you even more nuts. So right now we're spending 1.4 percent of GDP on net interest on the federal deficit. By 2020, only 10 years away, we'll be spending well over twice as much, 3.8 percent of GDP. Oh, and by the way, these are based on, I think, unrealistic assumptions about the interest rate. Right now, we have very low interest rates. Economists cannot explain why they're so low because we borrow so much money. But at some point, it seems inevitable to the, that they're, they're going to go up. Uh, and if they do go up, then these, uh, the, the picture that I'm presenting right now will be even worse. Nonetheless, 16.5% of our GDP will be paid primarily to foreigners by 2050 if we don't change the path that we're on. And you'll get an idea in a few minutes of how much money that really is. So our deficit, uh, which is now 9%, scheduled to go to 6.6%. If you believe in this, then you believe in Santa Claus. Uh, and by 2050, it will be over a quarter of our uh, gross national product will be, a, that's how big our deficit will be. T completely unprecedented. So this is an important part of the picture. Now, the rising debt to GDP ratio. This is a very technical issue. Uh, this is something I was going to start out by saying I do not consider myself a great budget expert. I, I do not have a background in budgets, but when I got to Washington, I fig quickly figured out Wash uh, that the budgets are a big deal. Um, I've been, been in Washington 25 years now, so I've been interested in budgets, but most of this is self-taught. I have had the opportunity at Brookings to hang out with some true budget experts, so I've learned a lot uh, in meetings, and we have several groups there that focus on the deficit. Um, so if we want to play stump the speaker when this is over, uh, it won't be all that difficult. Nonetheless, look at this picture of the amount of interest that we are going to pay. Uh, I'm sorry, the debt to GDP ratio uh, which is largely a story of interest, as I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, and the recent work on this is very controversial, but there's getting to be something like an agreement that anything over 90% of debt to GDP, so this means that when the total accumulated deficit of a, of a country is added up, uh, and as a percent of GDP, so you have the total national debt in the numerator and the and total gross domestic product in the, in the denominator, and that percentage uh, is what's in question here. And there's a lot of agreement now. This has been developing, I would say, over the past year and a half or so, primarily based on work of Rogoff and Reinhardt, uh, that when you hit 90 percent, that's danger. And they base this on an amazing 
a historical overview of several hundred nations that got into trouble, this going, going all the way back to the 14th century, uh, of nations that got in trouble, and they developed the idea, which people have criticized, I say, this is not a hard and fast number, but when you hit 90% of GDP, this is an area where you really could have some serious problems, so serious that your gross domestic product will begin uh, to decline. So here it is, by 2020, we'll be right on the edge of the Rogoff and Reinhardt uh, cliff. And then in 2030, we'll be well over it. And by 2050, we will just be in completely uncharted territory. Very few countries in the history of the world have ever had a debt to GDP ratio that great. So this is another expression of how serious and deep our problem is. All right, I promise to tell you about the effects of net interest. Uh, here we see Social Security. Uh, as a, uh, this is a percent of GDP. This is what's going to happen between now and 2080. So even though this line is flat, spending goes up rapidly because you assume that the GDP is growing. So Social Security is growing slightly as a rate of GDP. Our medical expenditures continue to grow and are you know, basically out of control. They're still out of control. This is debatable, but I do not think, and I think most experts agree, including Democratic experts, they won't necessarily say this out loud, uh, that the Obamacare has, if anything, increased costs. It certainly has not bent the curve, as the President used to say. Um, and then you have net interest, and look at what a part of this net interest is. And what is net interest? Just reflect for a minute on what net interest is. Interest means that we wanted more than we could afford. So we went out and got it. And we did that by borrowing money, primarily from foreigners, especially the Chinese and the Saudis, great friends of ours, no threat to America, to be sure. <laughs> and the funny thing about borrowing is, eventually you have to pay it back, plus the interest. And the interest, in one way of thinking, is completely wasted. This is what really bothers me as just a normal, not necessarily a budget guy that has all kinds of abstract concepts. Interest is wasted. Americans know this lesson very well because we waste a ton of our income on interest if we'd wait to buy things and plan better. Uh, even our in individual lives, we would do well. But now, in our public life, this is just, as I say, beyond precedent. So interest is a huge part of this problem, and interest is a direct measure of the lack of discipline of the American public and the desire to have it now. I can remember when I was a kid, they had a uh, chocolate that you put in a drink, and it was called Bosco. Probably not very many people remember that, but it was called Bosco, and you would mix it up in your drink. And in one of their commercials, they had a little kid, and he told his mother, he said, I want my Bosco, and he raised his hand and he hit it on the table and said, I want my Bosco, and I want it now. And boy, did the generation of Americans that were alive then get that message because we want our benefits, by golly, and we want them now. And even though we're going to pass some, the costs on to our children, no problem. Think of it this way. We had a $3 billion program called Cash for Clunkers that was going to ignite our economy. So far, it hasn't been ignited too much. Uh, and he, here's what it actually amounts to. We borrowed that $3 billion, half of it from the, roughly uh, from foreigners, a little more than half. And so what does that mean? That means that our kids have to pay it back. And what does that mean? That means that we wanted a car and we had our kids and grandkids pay for it. That's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean anything else. You can make up all kinds of complex excuses and so forth, but we decided we want our cars now and we're going to let our kids and grandkids pay for it. And that story, that's only $3 billion, which is nothing compared to the problems we're talking about here, but that is the general story that I'm telling to you writ large. Uh, this is the, uh, now I want to go to the second part of the presentation. I want to talk about polls, which are a little bit discouraging. Uh, this part is encouraging. In the old days, if you ask people what are the most, what's the most important pu public problem, 35% of people would say that it's the deficit. And as you can see, there's been a fairly nice pattern, a little bit of drop here, but it goes up all the way to 60% of the public now says that debt and the deficit is is one of our most, is our most important national priority. Uh, that looks good. Um, and then if you uh, ask what percentage of the public is worried about various problems, including deficits, here's what you find. 14 percent 
that's their greatest concern 25 years from now, that, uh, that we will have problems, still have problems with our deficit, and it goes down from there. So these two sets of polls tend to say that the problem is getting a little bit, the public is focusing a little bit more on this problem, which I think is true, uh, but let's now see what the public is really willing to do. So are you willing to pay higher taxes because we have this deficit? And the public says, yes, 18% of them. Two out of 10. How many say no? Seven out of 10. We live in a democracy, it ain't gonna work. They're not willing to pay taxes. They're willing at least now to say the deficit is a serious problem, it's the most serious problem that we're facing, but on the other hand, we're not gonna have our taxes raised. And similarly, if we're gonna cut education or healthcare education, 30% uh, say to be willing to do that. 62% no, no, they're not willing. These are the now I want my Bosco uh, group, which is still quite a majority. And then if we say are you willing to decrease military spending, it does get a little higher here. 45% say yes, but even here, which would have no direct immediate impact on people, uh, they, even half, of the, half the people still would not be willing to do that. So this is generally the picture, and this is I think you, we could fault the American people, and when I say the American people, I'm talking about everybody in this room and me. We're all part of the public here, uh, and we're willing to finally to begin to develop some understanding of the nature of the problem, but we're not willing to take the action that's necessary. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. Uh, now, here are some specific programs that Americans could cut, and notice the one that's the most popular to cut, foreign policy. We spend about 11 cents on foreign policy, but by golly, 70% of Americans, they're willing to cut that foreign policy on the grounds that it probably is not gonna hurt them or other Americans. I think that's the main part of the thinking. Uh, and then 29% uh, would be willing to cut environmental programs and so on, you can see down here. And the big programs, the Medicaid's, the Medicare's, the Social Securities, the ones that are absolutely gonna have to be cut, there's no question, we have to do it. Uh, and public's unwilling, and you've seen that in other polls, it's consistent finding in the polls. So even though the American public is at last beginning to get part of the picture, there still is a huge problem out there because they're not willing to take the actions that are necessary to fix things. Uh, here's some more specific solutions other than just programs, something like a proposal. So if we raise income taxes on the wealthy, Bill Archer was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee when I was there. I knew Bill Archer pretty well. And Bill Archer used to talk, whenever he talked about this sort of thing, or taxes in general, he would always say, you know the philosophy of the American public, here's what it is. Don't tax you. Don't tax me. Tax that guy behind the tree. And that's how we all feel about this. And you can see this principle in operation in Washington, that when it comes to paying a bill, nobody wants to pay it. Everyone wants the benefits, no one wants the bill. So how about but there are relatively few of the wealthy, and besides that, maybe we think they can afford it. So quite a few people would be willing to increase taxes on the elderly. How about cut discretionary federal programs? And I would say on the whole, we could get into a big debate over this, but they have the least direct influence on the way we live our day-to-day -day lives, and yet 57 and 57 percent of the people would be willing to cut those. But then when we get down to things that would affect the broad public, like uh, taxes on the middle class as well as the wealthy, only a quarter of the people would be willing to do it. Entitlement programs that absolutely have to be cut is one of my main themes today. Uh, less than a quarter would be willing to do it. Or a new federal tax, only 20% would be willing to do it. Now this shows something I think is extremely important. The American public has kind of a, something like a genetic understanding that if you give those guys in Washington more money, you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna spend it. They're not gonna cut the deficit, they're gonna spend that money. Why? Because that's the best way to get elected, that you did this, you did this, you did this. And we see this during election season. It seems like half the campaign uh, that people are in Congress and come and say that they have brought the bacon home, you know. Uh, and so uh, the public, I think, has over the years uh, learned something from that, namely that politicians like to spend money and Republicans are if anything, just as bad as the Democrats. Now, good news, some good news. This is all the good news I have, I'm afraid, uh, on this one chart. 
And uh, this was developed, uh, an organization got an uh, interesting idea of instead of just asking people a question in the polls, as happens in 99% of the cases, actually try to educate the public. So they went around the country. I think they did, uh, I think they did 12 of these. They were day long, roughly a cross-section of people in the community, and they present them with all kinds of information, sort of the kind of thing that I'm presenting you right now. And then they ask them these questions about, well, would you be willing to have your taxes raised? Would you be willing to cut Social Security and so forth? Uh, and now let's see what they said as a result of additional knowledge. 68% are now willing to uh, gradually raise the age of eligibility from 65 to 67 on Medicare. So that's, that would have a dramatic impact. Um, it would also have some negative effects on people's health, uh, probably, and it would depend on how many have insurance coverage and so forth, but there would be some negative effects. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If you change federal spending in, at the degree to which we're talking about here, there will be negative effects, and I think it's a mistake to try to make the public think, oh, no, no, it's all waste and abuse, and once we solve that, everything will be fine. It's not. We're going to have to cut things that will hurt. 68% uh, support progressive scaling your premiums to income, which, in effect, it's means testing or uh, asking people to have more money to pay more for their health insurance or the actual, uh, not only the insurance, but the actual treatment that they get. 79% support raising taxes to maintain the uh, benefit level. 75% support uh, national sales tax. Remember on the other one, it was 20%. So this is a, a monster increase. 63% uh, support raising the payroll tax rate. So these results, and in fact, here, there are even more. Here it is, here are some questions specifically on taxes, and here, Something that emerged consistently from these sessions was the public does not trust policymakers. This is a very clear message. Uh, and there are all kinds of polls that show this, so this is not really anything new. And they, but they want to make sure that there's something that absolutely guarantees that they won't be willing to sacrifice, and then the uh, politicians will spend the money some other way. So they want to make sure that it actually goes to deficit reduction or some other purpose that they want it for. And then under these circumstances, 57 uh, percent support raising taxes, reduces deficit, 67 uh, percent support investment in education and other things. This is another part of the problem we haven't talked about yet. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. And not only are we going over a cliff financially, but it's going to, it is already, I would say, and we'll soon do even more to prevent the kind of investments we need to move ahead as a country. Um, so let's talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, before we do that, though, it, I do think there's reason to be optimistic about this point, and especially uh, in the you know, heart of a great university here with probably 95% of this audience in one way or another associated with the university, that universities are places that could play a real role here. Uh, we, we need a public that understands what they're doing, and we need a public that understands the consequences of the people they vote for and the consequences of not demanding that their elected officials do the right thing. And here's a, this is a massive failure on the part of the American public to A, understand the problem, and B, even once they understand it, to take the appropriate action. So the finding that education, when people really understand how serious the problem is, that it really changes at least what they say. Now, whether it changes what they would actually do and what they would actually support, that might be another issue. But it's still hopeful that education has a big role to play here. And I think it's a especially interesting thing, in a, as I say, in the heart of a great university to realize uh, this, the, the, the finding that this, uh, that this implies. So why do deficits matter? Here are five great reasons. We're gonna, we are already dependent on foreign lenders. I think we could make an argument that it's already influenced our foreign policy. Uh, rap, whoops, that we have rapidly rising interest costs, which we've already seen uh, in previous charts that are a burden on future generations, I'll talk more about that, limited ability to invest in children, and limited ability to address emergencies. Now this is the first time except in passing that I've mentioned this, but I would suggest that you reflect on this. As a nation, we used to lead everybody in everything. We don't anymore. We don't lead people in educate, other countries in education. We do not have the most edu educated uh, population. It's not unusual that on international comparisons of tests and mathematics and language, 
uh, that America finishes, you know, fifth, eighth, eleventh. The re re recent international testing in uh, language and mathematics, um, tiny Singapore was first in two of the four comparisons at various grade levels. Uh, the United States was not higher than fourth in anything and was 11th uh, at both grade levels in science. So our education is not great. So we probably, part, I mean, there are lots of parts of the solution here. We can talk about this if you'd like to. Uh, but money is going to be part of the issue. And we're spending our money on interest, and we're sending it to foreigners. It's just, that's the kind of consequence that I want to draw your attention to. It isn't just that we're going to break the bank. It's during the course of the time that we get there, we're going to be misspending a lot of our money. We are not going to have enough to make the investments we need to move ahead as a nation. Uh, I would try to make this argument on defense as well, but I think I won't try to do that with this audience, uh, being a wimp like I am. Um, so let's talk about each of these in turn. Foreign lenders. Here is the, the uh, debt of the United States. And this is only over a period of 10 years from 2000, actually nine years from 2001 to 2009. And the debt goes up every year. And the percentage of debt held by foreigners is huge. And even when you get to 47% here, which was 49% in 2008, you can see that there was a huge jump in the amount of the debt. Uh, so this actually is more money, as you can see by the height of this bar graph. So now we have to ask ourselves, is it good that we would have borrowed money that we could not pay back in any, in the short term, it's going to take a long time to pay this money back, at current interest rates. And it's not like this is forever. We keep selling this debt. It keeps rolling over. You know, some of the bonds are five years, some are longer, but it keeps rolling over. So we have to keep enticing them to buy our debt. Now, what if we got into a conflict? Say, Chinese decided to invade Taiwan. We made all kinds of promises. Maybe we shouldn't have, but we did. So are we going to back down because we might be afraid of what the Chinese would do? Or are the Saudis? Saudis do a lot of stuff that is directed at hurting America. They s support lots of uh, terrorist groups. They deny it, but I think the evidence is pretty strong that they do. And yet, we bar have borrowed so much money from them, we have to be a little bit cautious. Many people say that when the president recently visited China, that his stance a little bit cagey, a little bit cautious on human rights was dictated in part because the president can read mathematics like the rest of us, and he knows how much in debt we are to China. Now, you could not prove a charge like that, but that at least gives you an idea of the sort of thing that we already face and that is getting worse and worse and worse. And when you think about those interest rates I showed you in 2040, 2050, 2060, then we'll really be indebted to foreigners. So uh, dependence on foreigners is a huge part of this problem. We've already talked a lot about interest rates, but look at this. If you can imagine by 2020 that we have almost a trillion dollars a year, 80% of a trillion dollars in interest. So it, it is just outrageous how we're wasting our money because we have to have it now. Uh, burden on future generations. These poor little children are going to get, they're going to pick up the tab for what we're doing. I really think that this is potentially the most effective argument to use with the American public. I think if the American public really thought through this, and you could tell them things like the little ditty I told about the measly $3 billion on the cash for clunkers that, you know, in effect, our kids and grandkids bought cars for us. And the big problem, you know, is, is huge compared to that. But if we could get that idea across the American public and they could accept the logic of there's no other way to think of this, you have to, unless you believe in a tooth fairy, you've got to pay this money back. And we're not going to pay it back in our lifetime. We're, it looks to me like we're not going to pay it back in God's lifetime. Uh, but so we're passing it on relentlessly to our children, and I think this, in the long run, may be the most effective argument. Now, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go through these quickly because these get technical right away. But I'm going to make a very controversial argument, and we can, we're going to leave enough time here that we could argue about a little bit in, in case anybody wants to. I see a lot of people out there with gray hair. Fortunately, I'm still very young, have no gray hair or anything. Uh, uh, but in the long run, we have to, I'll put this in the softest way I can, 
we have to modify our payments and spending on the elderly. That doesn't necessarily mean we have to cut it, but we have to cut it relative to the growth that's projected. So we could continue to spend more and more and more on the elderly, but not as much more and more and more as it currently planned. We have to cut back on the increases, in other words. And we have to figure out ways to do that in both Medicare and in Social Security and in other benefits for the elderly. And I'll show you one outrageous example. We have to stop it before we start. We're about to start. So here's how much we spend. This is all public spending. We spend about $22,000 on the average person over age 65 and about $9,000 on the average child. If you look at just the federal spending, elderly is approximately the same because the primary benefits of public spending are Social Security and Medicare. And for children, it drops down very dramatically. And the answer why is public education, that the states pay most of the bill for public education. There are other parts of it too, but education is the real difference here. So if you look at federal expenditures, it, doesn't it occur to you that, you know, we love to say our kids are the future, the future is children, which is true, and yet we're investing so much more in the elderly who are not the future. We owe them something, they paid insurance and so forth, we can talk about that too if you want to, but nonetheless, if we're worried about our future, wouldn't we want to invest more in our children? Uh, and thanks to modern social science, we have lots of evidence that we could spend money on children's programs, that we have very, very good evidence from random assignment experiments that it would work, that it would make the kids healthier, smarter, uh, more focused on work, more focused on what they're supposed to do, less likely to have babies outside marriage, less likely to commit crime as adolescents. And as I say, these are very good, this is very good evidence. And for at least half of these that I've listed here, we also have benefit cost evidence that we could actually save money if we made these investments. The most familiar case is preschool. I think you can make an extremely strong case that if we invested more in high quality preschool, that we would get long run benefits that would more than pay for the amount of money that we spend in preschool. So my point here is we're not spending enough on kids and we're even depriving ourselves and the nation of benefits uh, that would be greatly exceed the amount that we would invest in children if we would invest more. And yet our deficit is driving us away from this. And I absolutely guarantee you, in the next, who knows, five years, maybe three years, maybe 10 years, there will be Armageddon in Washington and we will really cut some programs. There will be a Donnybrook. And when that happens, kids' programs will be cut. Kids are the least influential politically. I do think that the argument that you know, these are our children and so forth, that those do have some traction in Washington, but when push comes to shove and members of Congress have to decide whether they're gonna cut programs for the elderly or cut programs for children, children's programs are gonna get the brunt of the cuts. I think that's inevitable. Uh, so not only are we not gonna be able to make these investments, but we could spend less than we're spending now. I think it's a very good possibility. And then we have lots of other things that we need to be investing in too. Wars and terrorist attacks are bound to happen. I mean, there's just no question that eventually we're gonna have another terrorist attack in the United States. I don't see any way we can avoid it. We've done a terrific job so far. I think, generally speaking, we have responded well as a nation, uh, but we've had several narrow misses. Uh, Fort Hood was not really a miss, but if you could imagine Fort Hood on a much larger scale, so maybe we're not spending enough money on anti-terrorist activities. We always face natural disasters. It seems like, you know, a lot of people say because of global warming, but we've had lots of national, uh, natural disasters in recent years, and they can really, really be expensive. And in fact, a lot of people think we should have spent more on Katrina than we did, but we were restricted because we're fighting two wars. We have a huge deficit, so we, could, we should have spent more and invested more there. And then, of course, recessions. I mean, if you just think about how much money we have spent in the last couple of years, I love it when Republicans criticize the president for spending on a recession for a stimulus package. Don't forget, the very first stimulus package was, was lobbied for and signed by President Bush. It was $150 billion, which is a lot less than 870 or whatever the Obama package was. But still, we've spent easily a trillion dollars uh, on the recession and probably another you know, half trillion at least, maybe more, it's hard to say because some of the money's being paid back on the financial crisis. 
And most people think, certainly in the financial crisis, if we had not spent that money, we would have had a much worse crisis than we did. And where did we get the money? Every penny of it borrowed, because we're already in debt. So we're really handicapping ourselves, not just in, in human terms in the development of our children, but in many other uh, things that we, the government can really help the country with uh, and, um, and make for a better future. So let's talk now. I've cleverly left about uh, a minute and a half for solutions uh, because I think our solutions are all so painful uh, that even if an audience is with me up to this point, uh, I think maybe a lot of people would start to depart. So let's talk first about the conditions that we need to really establish uh, a serious attack on the deficit. Uh, and let me say, by the way, uh, and we might want to talk about this, and I urge you to think about it, we don't actually need to bring the deficit to zero. I think almost, almost all economists agree, if we could have a steady deficit at a lower percentage of GDP and then maintain that deficit, we still have interest payments, uh, we still have a lot of the negative consequences here, but we wouldn't be threatened with some huge crisis. A recent uh, National Academy panel thought that we should stop at 60% of GDP. Remember I talked about the debt to GDP ratio and that 90% is the edge of the cliff. A huge group of true budget experts uh, working in a panel for the National Academies of Science uh, said that 60% would be safe. But to get to 60% and to maintain 60% is still going to take many of the actions that I'm talking about here. And there will be deep pain, there'll be huge fights and so forth. But it isn't that we necessarily have to get to zero. We've got to stabilize the debt as a fraction of GDP and keep it there uh, for the foreseeable future. I, I would think after we do that, then we ought to start going down even further. But as a temporary objective, I think that's a reasonable thing. So what do we need to get there? First of all, we have to have public re recognition, which we're beginning to get. But then we need public willingness to pay new taxes and to accept spending cutbacks. There, I don't think we have it yet. I don't think we're even close. And especially once the cuts start, and you know, my mother's Social Security check, possibly, well, my mother would not be in uh, uh, threat here. She's 92 years old, I think she's safe. But anybody who's 55 and younger, their checks would be you know, would be lesser, their taxes would go up or both. That's what we really heard if you had to pay higher taxes and got lower benefits. Uh, so will the American public accept these? They won't now. We need to get there. Everything on the table in Washington, the Republican position, no new taxes, has got to be squashed. Uh, I'm a Republican. I've said this before. I've had lots of friendly phone calls from former colleagues. Uh, and I even once was asked to testify before the Budget Committee and True honesty that my mother taught me required me to say to them, well, I've made talks of, and said that we should increase taxes. And the guy said, well, let me check into that. He called me back about 10 minutes later, a good friend of mine. He said, well, Ron, I don't think we need you to testify anymore. <laughs> uh, but look, I mean, every Republican knows in their heart, there is no way that we're going to get any kind of a deal with spending cuts and tax increases unless we have the tax increases. We just can't get a deal without it. So we have to have tax increases. Plus, the magnitude of the cutting here, it, it can't be done. We couldn't do the whole thing on the spending side. It's got to be roughly split between taxes and spending or we're not going to get a deal. And besides that, it's unreasonable to think we could cut that much anyway. So everything has to be on the table. There has to be a bipartisan solution, which is really our greatest weakness right now. The parties are at each other's throat and I think it's going to get worse. There's now even talk of impeaching Obama, uh, which, you know, is just going to poison the atmosphere even more if, any, if that even became serious. Uh, Washington is in no bipartisan shape. And finally, presidential leadership. I once did a little, Bell Sawhill and I, an economist at Brookings, uh, we did inter, uh, interviews with 20 senior budget officials, and we asked them a series of uh, questions about what would take to get a deal? And every single one of them agreed. You couldn't do it without presidential leadership. The president has got to be a leader. I think Obama is willing to a certain extent. Uh, it appears he might even be more willing than Bush. Uh, he at least appointed a commission. Let's see what he does with the commission recommendations. But we've got to have 
presidential leadership. I don't think we're going to get a deal unless we have all these conditions met. Now, some general rules for procedure here. The first thing is that we have to make a sharp distinction between our short-term problem and long-term problem. And I say this to you because we are just now on the leading edge of the retirement of the baby boom. And in addition to those constant increases in Medicare and other health expenditures, we're now going to have a huge increase in the number of people who are going to be getting those Medicare benefits. So in the long run, and this is going to continue to increase, so we've got this short-term problem, we already have a huge deficit, but now it's going to really begin to build up, and especially starting roughly 10 years from now, it will build up at an alarming rate. So we need to, the sooner we take action, the better. Um, second, uh, combination of spending cuts and revenue incentives, I think that's the only way to get a deal. That's the history in Washington. Both sides have to give something up or you can't get a deal. Uh, third, no implementation on economies and recovery. I think there's also great agreement on this. But we could put down a plan. We could say what the elements of a plan would be and try to get bipartisan agreement. And indeed, that's exactly what the President's Deficit Commission should do. They should come back in November when they have to report, and they should lay out the elements of a plan. If they do that, there are 18 members of the Commission, 14 have to agree in order to get a deal. If we, if by some miracle, it's not going to happen. But if it did, and 14 of the members of that commission agreed on the outline of a plan, it would be a huge step forward. Then we would really begin to get serious and engage the public, I think. Uh, we obviously have to do this gradually. You can't do things all of a sudden. You could do it over a period of years. Unfortunately, almost all economists agree we still have enough time to do that. We could do this over a decade or even more. Uh, and the National Academies panel uh, reached the same conclusion, so I think this is widely agree that this will be part of the plan. And then we've got to have, this is probably the hardest part, we've got to have savings from the big entitlement programs because there's just not enough money elsewhere. And the beauty of cutting the entitlement programs or changing the rate of their increase is that you get a bonus every time you cut. And the bonus is that the interest payments go down. So you get, you get a nice benefit. If you can reduce spending, you get a benefit because that means that the, that the uh, interest payments also go down. Um, I'm going to skip over these next things because I want to leave time for questions. Um, do you make this available on a website or something? I hope so because these are really interesting data. These show, you know, we tend to think of the elderly and poverty and so forth, but we're one of the first countries in the world, and many other countries now have this, where the elderly are really better off than kids. Uh, and in many ways, they're better off than the rest of the population. The point is that the elderly could afford to make some sacrifices, uh, much more so than they're doing now. And here are a whole bunch of significant uh, actions that could be taken. Social Security take me an hour to explain all these, and I'd probably confuse you more than I would explain it. But I just want you to understand, these have been estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. We know a lot of changes in Social Security and a lot of changes in Medicare that would save us a lot of money and could get us to that 60% figure. So we don't, we don't suffer for solutions. We know what they are. This is not like some kind of scientific problem, we need new discoveries or something, a lot of issues like that in the environment. But here, we've got the solutions, we know what they are, we've got lots of choices, we need to reach agreement on them. Um, and then I uh, uh, outline another series of steps here, I'm going to skip over that too. Um, revenue options, we have some very nice revenue options. The worst is to increase tax rates, there's broad agreement that that would be the worst way to go because our tax code is so messed up now because we have so many exclusions and deductions and exemptions and so forth that the, our tax code is extremely unfair and inefficient and hurts the economy. But if we broaden the base of the tax code, and this is a beauty of mathematics, that you don't have to change the rates. If you broaden the base, you get more money. And you make the tax code fairer, and it could pay for itself in the long run because it'll have positive effects on the economy because it'll be fairer. Uh, and people won't be taking all kinds of evasive, evasive actions. Americans spend a shocking amount of money filling out their tax forms because they're so complicated. If we had a simpler tax code, a flatter tax code with a broader base and got rid of, we have something like $1.2 trillion in various tax exclusions and deductions and credits and so forth. And they're very unfair uh, and so we ought to stop that. Um, we also have some very nice energy tax possibilities. I think it seems funny to talk about nice possibilities, but for example, I'm sure everybody in this room would support a dollar increase in the gas tax. Well, 
This would get us 1% of GDP. That's like $130 billion a year, which is a nice down payment. But in addition, it would have very positive effects on the environment because Americans would drive less. Plus, it would make us less dependent on some of these wonderful friends that we have in the Middle East. So energy taxes are some good possibilities. Consumption taxes, like a, a value-added tax, also have positive effects because they promote savings, which promotes investment, which promotes growth in the future. So even though we often get a hideous story about taxes, and clearly Americans don't want to pay them, as the data I've shown you proves without question, there are good benefits in addition to just taking care of our deficit. Uh, I'm going to, uh, now, I, this is the last thing I'm going to say. And this, this should be the absolute cap on the argument that our policymakers are not serious. In the health bill, a provision was stuck in called the Class Act. Now, Democrats did this, but Republicans would have done it too under similar circumstances. It's long-term care insurance. They put it in there because according to CBO, it will save $58 billion. And remember all the talk about the bending the curve and all that, so Democrats are really intent on showing that this bill is gonna save money. Well, why did it save this money? And the answer is that their benefit or taxes, whatever you wanna call them, to put your people buying the insurance up front, and there are virtually no benefits in the 10-year time window. All the costs are outside the 10-year time window. And so when CBO looks at CBO, again, one of the rules that they had to comply with was they're doing a 10-year estimate. So they can put a little footnote and say, oh, by the way, this is going to intensify the deficit 10 years from now when it's already going to explode. So instead, they did a special study, and here's what CBO said. The program would add to future federal budget deficits in a large and growing fashion. And nonetheless, it's in the bill, it is now public law, and it, it's in there because it saved that $58 billion and deceived the American public to think that the bill cost less than it actually did. And to do that, we put something in that intensifies this whole problem that I've been talking to you about and really is so symbolic because it's a, it, it's a, an, it's a beautiful example of what both Republicans and Democrats do to get immediate political goals achieved, that they sell out our children and grandchildren. This is a serious problem. We have to take action. It's the fall of the public. We need better elected officials, and we need to discipline them once they get there. Questions?